Luke, a talented jazz pianist. He built a reputation, not only for his musical talent, but also for his inspiring story of sobriety, having overcome an alcohol addiction 25 years ago. But then, out of the blue, he got a DUI, despite claiming that he'd never had a drop of alcohol. And after that, he started showing up at the emergency department with obvious signs of alcohol intoxication. But still, he claimed that he wasn't drinking. So was he lying? Or was something else going on? Luke had always considered himself to be healthy, aside from the occasional headache and sinus infection. But two years ago, he started having these episodes of extreme fatigue, to the point that he would actually fall asleep during tasks like cooking dinner or responding to emails. And he couldn't seem to predict when it was gonna happen. He even had to call in sick and cancel a few gigs, and it would take a few days until he would feel like himself again. So he described these episodes to his family doctor, who ordered some blood work, checking his thyroid function, vitamin B12 level, blood counts, and a sleep study to check for sleep apnea. Reassuringly, everything was normal. So his doctor suspected it might be related to stress or poor sleep. In medicine, we often see these vague symptoms with an unclear cause. And I always like to say that bad things get worse and good things get better. And in Luke's case, things went from bad to worse. One day, Luke's son came over and found him slumped over in his chair, slurring his words and having difficulty walking. In a panic, his son rushed him to the hospital, scared that he was having a stroke. When he arrived in the hospital, his vital signs were normal, but the nurse noted that he smelled of alcohol. And yet, he denied drinking any alcohol, reaffirming that he'd been sober for 25 years. And his son backed him up, saying that he'd never seen his father drink in his entire life. Then he had some basic blood work, including a drug toxicology screen and a CT scan of his head. This time, everything was normal, except one test. His blood alcohol level was over three times the legal limit. And yet, even with objective evidence that there was alcohol in his blood, Luke continued to insist that he hadn't been drinking. So we've got a patient with a history of alcohol abuse who comes in with slurred speech, unable to stand straight, and he's got alcohol in his blood. His doctor figured this was a slam dunk, case closed. Luke must have relapsed and was drinking again. So he was discharged from the emergency department to sober up. Luke was horrified. It must be some kind of a mistake. Could the test be wrong? Maybe they mixed up the blood samples. But even his family was starting to doubt him, searching the house for a hidden stash of alcohol. But they didn't find anything. Luke's symptoms lingered for days before resolving which is longer than you'd expect, even if he'd been binge drinking. And he was left feeling really confused about what had happened. A few weeks later, Luke was driving home after a jazz performance. He was feeling tired and frustrated that his playing had been a bit sloppy. Then he heard a police siren and pulled over to the side of the road. The police officer smelled alcohol in his breath and asked him to step out of the car. And to his horror, he blew over the legal limit. Luke was arrested for driving under the influence. His car was impounded and he spent the night in jail. He was released the next day, completely flabbergasted and determined to fight the charges. He knew that he hadn't had a drop of alcohol. Every few weeks, he'd have a new episode and he'd go to the emergency department looking for answers. And each time, his blood alcohol levels were high. The emergency doctor soon recognized him as a regular and he was labeled as an alcoholic. Luke's world was crumbling around him and he started wondering if he was losing his mind. Was he actually drinking and then having amnesia? Or could he be sleepwalking and then drinking? Or was this medical gaslighting? He didn't know who to trust or what to do. Finally, on his seventh visit to the emergency department, he met a young doctor who actually seemed to believe him when he swore that he hadn't been drinking. This new doctor sat down with him and asked specific questions about his diet. He noted that each of these episodes seemed to happen after Luke had eaten a high carbohydrate meal, like pasta or going out for pizza. Could it be? His doctor had a hunch, but he couldn't be sure. So Luke was sent to a gastroenterologist for further investigations. The specialist reviewed his case and ordered a glucose challenge test. You've probably heard of this test in the context of pregnancy because we give it to women to screen for gestational diabetes. So similarly, Luke ate 100 grams of glucose and then every few hours they did blood work on him. But they weren't actually very interested in his blood sugar. Instead, 
they were testing his blood alcohol level. And shockingly, after just a few hours, his blood alcohol concentration started to skyrocket. Now, keep in mind that during this test, Luke was being closely monitored. So there was no way that he was drinking alcohol in the clinic. It seems like his body was converting sugar to alcohol. But how was that even possible? To investigate further, Luke had an upper endoscopy where a specialist inserted a camera down his throat and into his digestive tract. Although his stomach and intestines looked normal, they took samples from the small intestines that showed an overgrowth of a yeast called Saccharomyces cerevisiae. Now, if you think that name sounds kind of familiar, first of all, I'm impressed, but that's likely because it's the most common yeast that's used to make bread, wine, and beer. So it's all starting to make sense. This yeast was fermenting the carbs that Luke was eating, quite literally brewing alcohol in his intestines, converting sugar to ethanol. So he wasn't drinking alcohol after all. He was making it himself. We finally have our diagnosis. Luke has auto brewery syndrome. To understand how this condition comes about, we need to talk about the trillions of bacteria living in our intestines. While it's common to think about all bacteria as bad or harmful, many of these microorganisms are actually really beneficial to our health. They produce essential vitamins, they help regulate our blood sugar, and they even make neurotransmitters like serotonin and dopamine that can help improve our mental health. Pretty amazing, right? But we can run into issues when there's an imbalance between the type of bacteria and yeast inside of our intestines. In other words, when the wrong crowd starts hanging around, it can cause problems. And that's what happens in auto brewery syndrome, where there's a massive overgrowth of organisms that turn sugar into alcohol. Now, we usually see this when someone has an underlying condition that affects their gut microbiome. Things like diabetes, liver disease, gut dysmotility disorders, or inflammatory bowel disease. But Luke doesn't have any of these conditions. So why did it happen to him? As you might recall, Luke has a history of sinus infections and he's had multiple courses of antibiotics in the past. Each time he took antibiotics, in addition to treating his infection, he killed off loads of good bacteria that were living inside his gut. And that gave an opportunity for other microorganisms to take up that space, in particular yeast, which doesn't get killed off by antibiotics. And then whenever he'd eat a high carbohydrate meal, the yeast would go to town making alcohol in his intestines. The same way that we turn sugars from grapes into wine. Of course, not everyone who takes antibiotics develops this condition, but it's just one more reason why we like to be judicious and only prescribe antibiotics when it's really necessary. So as you can imagine, auto brewery syndrome carries some serious consequences for patients beyond the obvious medical ones. People get fired for showing up to work intoxicated. And then there's the cases of drinking and driving. Can you really be blamed for failing a breathalyzer test when you didn't drink any alcohol? Think about it like any other medical condition. I'm not a lawyer, but if a healthy person has a seizure out of the blue while they're driving, is their car impounded? And are there criminal charges? There have actually been court cases about this where drivers have been acquitted after being diagnosed with auto brewery syndrome. Okay, now back to Luke. How was he treated? Well, there were three parts to his treatment. And the first was a strict low carb diet. Fewer carbs means less sugar for those little microbes to convert into alcohol. Luke was also treated with an antifungal medication called fluconazole, which kills off the fungus, the yeast in his intestine. And finally, he was given probiotics to replenish his gut microbiome with good bacteria. Months went by and Luke didn't have any more episodes, but he was really hoping to get back to his normal diet which should be possible if his gut microbiome was back to normal. So he had another glucose challenge test, and this time he didn't brew any alcohol. He was cured. But sometimes when the fancy diets and medications aren't working, doctors have to get creative. Now brace yourself for this one. We're talking about a solution that's surprisingly effective, but slightly unconventional. Enter the world of the fecal transplant. Yep, you heard me, a poop transplant. And here's the scoop, pun intended. The procedure involves taking stool from a healthy donor and then introducing it into the patient's intestines. Suffice it to say that this can either be accomplished with a pill or with a procedure. 
So you gotta pick your poison. <laughs> and here's a real case of a patient with auto brewery syndrome who was treated with multiple rounds of different antifungal medications with no success. He kept having relapses. And after the patient lost his driving license in a random police check, his doctors proposed a fecal microbiota transplant. His 22 year old daughter volunteered to be the donor and it worked. He was cured. Now this seriously highlights how important it is to have a healthy gut microbiome and the drastic measures that sometimes need to be taken to restore it. And there's a whole field of research that's looking at various conditions that could benefit from a fecal transplant, which is both weird and kind of exciting. So the moral of the story is we need to take our gut health seriously. There's more and more evidence showing us that our overall health is deeply linked to the health of our gut microbiome. If you like these medical mysteries, then give this video a like and be sure to subscribe. So that way I'll see you in the next video. So bye for now.